rise up, rise up, rise up. They say it's to protect you while they try to dispossess you of the right to decide between wrong or right to openly discuss what politicians hide they want to keep their secret plans from the public eye we gotta keep our fire burning keep our spirits bright we gotta rise up rise up rise up rise up people against the war rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people Money got no children And bombs ain't for building and Killing ain't no way to make a peaceful day As all of God's children can easily explain We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright Stand up and speak for what we know is right We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up Against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people. I see days ahead, kiss my children into bed all across the planet. In the history books with the dinosaurs I claim my power, I claim my rights And no dirty tricks are gonna change my mind I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war, 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 rise up. Hello. This is uh, Dan Shea with uh, Veterans for Peace uh, Forum, and I'm with Veterans for Peace Chapter 72 here in Portland. Um, I wanted to, we have a couple of guests today, so how the program is going to run is we're going to first have uh, uh, Sewell Jones, uh, uh, both a Vietnam veteran and author. Uh, we'll be talking about his book, his experiences. Uh, and also, second, we're going to have uh, Steve Gay, uh, an Air Force uh, <clears throat> veteran and uh, artist uh, who has been going through a number of difficulties through the uh, uh, VA and we need to talk about that sort of bureaucracy that's going on. And I wanted to make a, a couple of announcements. Uh, while we have Sewell here, uh, we are also going to have him at an event at uh, tomorrow at Laughing Horse Bookstore. Um, and so we'll be speaking uh, Sunday, May 23rd, we're going to start the program at 7 p.m., but people get there about 6.30. Laughing Horse Books is uh, it's up on the screen. is at 12th and Northeast 10th Street. That's just off Burnside. It's 12th Northeast 10th Street, uh, just off Burnside, um, north of Burnside there in the northeast section. And uh, we'll, so we'll be talking about his book there. You have an opportunity to buy it and, uh, and hear what he has to say more about that. We only have a, a, a little bit of time here to talk about things, and I want to cover a lot of different areas here. First of all, Saul so, and I met in about 2006 when I went back to an Agent Orange conference uh, for Vietnam, vet uh, Vietnam veterans, both in Korea and uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the Vietnamese veterans themselves, and we all came together on a conference. 
on Agent Orange for three days in 2006. I think it was uh, March of, of, of that year. And, uh, and it was an incredible uh, time for me when it was just going back there, uh, my first time back as a Vietnam veteran. And just the pe meeting the people, just an incredible time, just meeting the people and how forgiving uh, people seemed to, to be that here we were the people that invaded their country, killed their women and children, uh, destroyed their land, and yet their arms were open to us to hear our stories, to cry tears for us. Yeah, and it's it's just, pretty amazing when you, <clears throat> as, I, as, as the, this book I've written is called Meeting the Enemy, and of course there's a lot of enemies, right. and most of them are right inside of you, but meeting the people uh, and they just, you were talking about how we kill them, we poured chemicals on them, we right. bombed them, we kill, and all this horror, and yet they forgive us. Right. And I asked an old man one day, I said, I said, you know, how do you, how can you possibly do this? I mean, it doesn't make sense. And he says, Mr. Sewell, he said, I have a choice. He said, I can live in the past and I can live in misery or I can live in the future with hope. He said, I have to make a choice, I, and I choose to live with hope. He said, that doesn't mean I forget. Right. I just have, I, my choice is to be more positive about it. And I think that's a real lesson a lot, a lot of people need to learn, especially vets. Right. Let it go. It's gone. They're always telling me, it's gone. Let it go. Now move on. And it's a, that's a real healing process for me. And I thought, damn, if they can do it, why can't I do it? But also take responsibility, you know? Yeah, it's my responsibility, you know? You know? Uh, the mm -hmm. Vietnamese always tell me, now, oh, Mr. Mr. Sewell, you were a young man. Mm -hmm. You were doing what your country asked of you. We don't blame you. Well, maybe they don't, but I have personal responsibility. Right. right or, maybe I was lying to, doesn't matter. I made the choice. I pulled the trigger. Now it's my job to heal that, myself and them in some way or another. That's right. You know, now, and this, this is what I feel very, very important, very strongly about my job. Well, let's, let's, as we're talking about that, I mean, we want to cover a couple of things. So maybe we'll start off right off the bat when we talk about Agent Orange. Um, like I said, we were, I was back there for that conference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we know that, you know, we, our planes dropped some 7 million tons of bombs on people, uh, 400,000 tons of napalm. Um, you know, sprayed 20 million gallons of herbicides. And, and just earlier we were talking and I was saying, you know, did you, did you run across tigers and animals? Because I, I couldn't remember a bird uh, yeah. even there. We had the, the most animals that I ran across were snakes and scorpions and mosquitoes constantly. Yeah, yeah they had, <laughs> too bad they can't eat them. Yeah, so what's <laughs> but, happened to, you know, we don't often talk about also the environment that's been destroyed. Well. It, with the Agent Orange, is, first of all, we have to realize it's not historical. Yeah. It's, it's, we're still going like fourth generation now right. of kids born uh, with deformity from Agent Orange. But during the war, you know, we, they, they claim that we, about one-third of the hardwood forest was killed. About one-third of the mangrove was killed. Now, the, the hardwood forest, it doesn't grow back. So they have what we call, they call, quote, American grass. We call it elephant grass. Mm -hmm. It's a very heavy, sharp type of grass. And instead of having an, a multitude of insects and birds and all the animals that come with a, with a real forest, you have rats. Mm. So it changes now. One third of that forest is nothing but rats, which of course gets in the rice fields and things of that nature. Same way with their mangrove. You take one third of your mangrove away, well that's one third of your fishing process because where are the, where are the animals going to be born? They're replanting, they're reworking, but it has changed the whole ecology of that country. Mm. And yet we still have done nothing to help them. We've, we know they're, where the hot spots are. Right. They're the group called the Hatfield Group, you, we talked about in Vietnam, who has done the research over there, they know where the hot spots are, yet we've never done anything to really solve that problem. What's, what's the suggested solutions for solving? Well, the ultimate solution would be remove all the soil, yeah. incinerate it, oh, maybe 1,500 degrees, put it back in, then you have to re-fertilize, you have to recreate it. But it's so expensive, that's not gonna happen. And everybody knows it. So now they're talking about, well, how do you mitigate it? 
Well, you teach people how to live around it. So if you if you, if this is a hot spot, you teach people, well, raise your ducks and chickens upriver, mm -hmm. and your fish, and not not downriver. Or don't, or if you're going to be in a river, make sure. Or if you're going to raise fish in running water, so it's so it's washing through. If you raise fish, in, let's say in in a uh, bomb crater, which was very common, mm -hmm. you got all these heavy metals at the bottom. You have these toxins, and the fish are just contained in it. So you have to teach people how to live around this stuff. And now they're talking about, well, maybe we can take a type of clay and dome these things because this stuff will not penetrate the clay. But they, they really don't know. Just, it, it's like this thing going on in the gut. Yeah. A lot of guessing and hoping. Yeah. You know, finger crossing. Yeah. We were yeah we were talking about that earlier too. Yeah. But I, I now you know we've covered some of that. I'm, I'm really glad that I had an opportunity to meet you over there because I got to see Friendship Village and uh, you were. Uh, doing a lot of work, some 10 years in Vietnam? Yeah, just about 10 years I worked for the Friendship Village. Village. Yeah. And how did that get started, by the way? Well, uh, it's one of these guys that you just, it's one person decided to do something. Mm -hmm. And he and he originally, George Maizo said, you know, I want to build a pagoda mm -hmm. as, as a, uh, to show our friendship. And the Vietnamese said, we don't need a pagoda. We need medicine. We need somehow another to work. And George said, fine. He listened. He listened. There you go. Went back, raised money. Took him a long time to raise the money. Came back, said, "Here's your money. Let's get after it." And that, so their friendship village was was created because of George Mizo. And we had right now. There's about 120 kids that go through there. It's, it's a residential style hospital, and we try to give them medicine when we can, a medical treatment. We have small schools there. They have computers going now. So they got. We're trying to give them a life back. We also treat a lot of uh, North Vietnamese veterans. Mm -hmm. and, and one of my great, great joys is I have a really good interpreter and sit down and talk to these vets one-on-one -on -one or with a small group. And, and, and they just treat me like a brother. And we become very close. And, and I have a little game I play now. And I'm always telling myself, I remember you. <laughs> you, you shot me, 1968. <laughs> and then, of course, they start, they, it gets very nervous. And then they realize I'm joking, and they start volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was me. No, it, but it breaks that ice, yeah. gets down to the human, then they start telling me you their did, stories. You yeah, yeah. <laughs> they start, they start telling, but when you get down to that human level, yeah. how can you not love each other? Because yeah. we know what we experienced. Yeah. And it just creates a love for each other. It's just very, very beautiful. Well, and through, so you were spent some 10 years there, and then you decided, you know, you're going to write this book about uh, your experience going to Vietnam mm -hmm. and sort of coming back from Vietnam and what that meant, and then going back again. Right. So tell us a little bit about the book and uh, your journey here. Well, after being there quite a while, I realized I had a story to tell, and, and, and I just said, okay, do it, right or wrong, good or bad, sit down and do it. And basically what it is, I set the story up, you have to tell the war story. Yeah. It's, and it's not a war story, it's a story about what it does to the young man's mind, mm -hmm. his psychology, and starts breaking down and asking questions. And I knew what I was doing was wrong. But I was so inbred into the American way, so... Uh, inducted into the Marines, I couldn't lay the right, I could not say no. Then I returned home and I had to ask a lot of hard questions. Uh, the why, I was I always referred to it as the why. Why was I there? Why was my country there? Why did people lie? Why was this going on? Mm -hmm. And then finally I felt I had enough healing, enough presence to go back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then I returned to Vietnam as, as a uh, Bush Marine, I knew about 10 feet around me. All I knew was I'm watching my territory. I go back to Vietnam, now I get to meet the people and, and, and see people as a people. Mm -hmm. And it changed me as a human being. When you, when you uh, what was the why? why? Why did we go to Vietnam? Um, that is a question I cannot answer. answer. Yeah. And, I, and I do get asked that sometimes. And my short story on this is very simple. It started with the Bay of Pigs. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was told he was a weak president. He had to be more powerful if he wanted to get elected in 64. His advisors say, look, Jack, we're going to send 1,500 people. Red advisors, nobody's going to get hurt. Don't worry. Sure. He felt then they were going to give you a lot of press, and you're going to get elected in 64. He gets assassinated. Now 
Johnson comes in, and there's tapes, actually, you can, you can hear the tapes yourself, Bill Moyer, you can go online and punch this in and find Bill Moyer, and Johnson is talking to uh, Everett uh, Durkinson, yeah. and he says, Everett, you know we're not going to win this war. 1963, he's saying this. You know, he said, you know we're not going to win this war, but how in the hell do I get out of it? And Dirk has said, Lyndon, the American people will forgive you for everything except one thing, being a weak president. Right. So we've got two presidents, two men want to get elected president. My theory is four million Vietnamese die, 60,000 Americans die in country to get these two men. Now, I know there's a lot of politics involved and rhetoric right. that goes around this, but that's the knife point, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. No, it really is. And when you, when you, and there, are, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of different politics that go around it, and there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, the so-called uh, fear of the communists, the domino the theory, war, of course, or, that was the big you one. You know, uh, but those were uh, like, like uh, going into the Gulf War. You know, this whole idea that. Saddam was involved with the, the Taliban. You know, all these various things were set up uh, because people wanted political capital for their elections and for this idea of this sort of macho yeah. image that we have yeah. to be the strong man of this. And, this the, and the Congress under George Bush yeah. just didn't have the yeah. courage to say no yeah. because they were thinking, am <clears throat> I going to get reelected or not? They're not thinking. Or American boy is going to die, American girl right. is going to die. How many, how many Iraqis are going to? They're thinking, what, what are my points, and how, do I get elected? Yeah. yeah. And that's a terrible thing to go back to a country and say we kill four million people so these two guys get elected. How do you, how do you tell the mothers yeah. and the fathers? Well, this is that's what's happened to me. You know, when I came back, uh, we both talked about this in a, in a sense that last night you were saying it, and I was saying it when I came back is that I didn't want to talk about the war, you know. It took, right, me, yeah. it took me a long time before I could really talk about it. And I was, you know, I was opposed to it when, uh, when I was there. I was opposed to it when I yeah. came back, but I, uh, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it because I wanted to get on with my life. But it just seems like uh, year didn't after do year. Very well, didn't yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't do very well, and uh, I couldn't figure out what yeah. all this anger was about, you know. It, it somehow is in your being because um, I don't think you can go into war or kill somebody or or watch your buddies die. Right. You know, without it affecting you're a changed person. Right. Uh, there's a quote in this book. I, read. Uh, I did, I'm going to read the, this just a, a small part of it. And this was from more than two thousand years ago from a monk. His name is Ding Ming Dao. I'm just going to read the very last paragraph. If you go personally to war. You cross the line yourself. You sacrifice ideals for survival and fury of killing. That alters you forever. That is why no one rushes to be a soldier. Think before you want to change so greatly. The stakes are not merely one's life, but one's very humanity. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I, when I write this book, I was thinking about my humanity. And I had to come back and reconstruct who I was as a human being to stay alive, to keep from harming myself. And so it takes a lot of work to reconstruct yourself as a human being and find your humanity again. And this is what breaks my heart when I talk, when I talk to these young Iraq vets, mm -hmm. these young Afghan vets. I know what they're going to be doing. It's different, different mm -hmm. war, different time, different kids, different thing, but I know what they're going to be suffering. And they would just, maybe this will help a little bit. Maybe talking with you will help a little bit. Maybe picking up a hitchhiker and, will, but you've got to help them. We've got to, we got to give our blood to them. That's we deserve, right. They deserve it. So then as you, you were working that out as you came back, did, I mean, what kind of things happened to you when you came home? Well, I, I did like probably a lot of guys. Uh, found a job, found a girlfriend, got married, going to settle in, had the kid, the house, the car. Everything's going to be normal and okay, but it just kept getting crazier and crazier and crazy. And I realized this, I just couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't deal with it. So the very first thing I actually did was just, I bought this motorbike, uh, sold everything I owned, got divorced, and took off on a four-month motorbike trip sleeping in, out in the woods, trying to somehow or another piece this back together again. Mm -hmm. 
And it just took a long, long time. And I worked construction, I worked in the oil fields, and I even became a journalist for a while, and you know, drove trucks, you name it, and I did it, searching for these. I went to India, I was going to be enlightened in India, you know. I went to Mexico, I ate peyote for six weeks, and <laughs> just you name it, I did it <laughs> looking for them. And then I realized, you know, just, come on, you've got to ask your hard questions inside yourself. And, my, and I realized, when I really asked that, what I call the dagger point question, why did I go to Vietnam? Because my mother and father, my family wanted me to, and I couldn't say no. Mm. It was easier to kill strangers than say no to my family, say no to my country. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. And we keep sending boys back for that, for that, that yeah. same feeling. And then what happened then that you decided to go back to Vietnam? Well, I, I, I finally, after many, many, many years, a, a good friend of mine, Mike Cole, told me, he said, look, there's therapy out there. Mm -hmm. Go talk. Start talking. Start talking. And I did. I finally said, okay. And I started to, but anyway, and then I had enough presence of mind to finally go to back to Vietnam. And I think I told you this story last night, but it, 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 this changed me also. My very first day in Hanoi, I said, okay, this is it. Walk outside one time around the block. You know, did the odors, the noise, the faces, do it. So I was walking around the block and this Vietnamese man stopped me. Wanted to know if I had ever been to Vietnam before. And I thought, uh-oh, here it goes. But that's why I'm here. I said, yeah, I was, I was here with um, 3rd Marines in 1968. And he kind of pointed his finger like, you know, he said, oh, he says, you're the enemy. Mm. And my heart just fell and I really wanted to run. And I said, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the enemy. And he put his arms around me, gave me a big hug, and he said, welcome to Vietnam. And I'm thinking, oh, there's something here I've got to learn. You know, there's something here important. Mm -hmm. and then I was able to go forth and feel comfortable again. What a powerful meeting. And the title of your oh. book. You yeah, know. I Met the Enemy. I met the enemy. The, the, the enemy is me. <laughs> <laughs> what Pogo said, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I met the enemy and the uh, enemy or us. Me. But there's a lot of enemies we had inside yeah. of us. You know, yeah. I was angry at my government. I was angry at my parents. I was, but it's my, it, when you get right down to it, it's my responsibility. That's right. There it is. Yeah. Well, there's that, I mean, for me, it wasn't just, um, I was only there for about three months in Vietnam. And... My brother was in the same company in Platoon. He ended up coming over well. I just came off an operation. And he was, uh, they didn't want to have two brothers together, so they sent me out. I went back to, I went to the Philippines for the rest of my tour. But I had been on this operation where a number of people had been killed by mines and sniper fire, and then there's a blank in my memory, which uh, I'm afraid, you know, we went into this village, and uh, a lot of guys died at, uh, there. But they didn't, you know, they didn't, they were hitting. They were hitting mines, stepping on mines. And I hear right. an explosion yeah. and cry, and uh, and all of a sudden, you know, when we got back, it was, uh, there was like at the end. I, all I can remember is that all of a sudden there was silence, and we were waiting. And these trucks picked us up, and it seemed like we'd been out in the jungle for a couple of weeks. And they just drive us back, and it's like five miles from our base. And I couldn't figure out what this was. And these years I've been talking about this. Uh, you know, I I was proud to say I'd never fired my weapon at anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then my body just broke down and, and cried because I'd never thought of the idea that maybe I can't remember what happened in that village. And it is the f most frightening thing that ever struck me. And this is only a couple of years ago that that hit me. And it's, it, I always tell people, it, it, it isn't what I remember that bothers me. Yeah. It's what I don't remember. remember. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's just gone. It's blank. Uh, I've tried to do... Uh, Therapy and you know, time dates and it should, it's gone. Right. And the book I wrote, I, I kind of have to joke about it. It's, it's a memoir with a very bad memory. Because <laughs> you, know, you know, you know how it is. You don't know what really happened, as opposed you think happened, as opposed you dream happened, read, believe. Right. And it gets all Mixed gumbled, up. and you don't know anymore. Yeah. Uh, but so you, you come down to the basic that you, you know that killing people is wrong. Killing and, people is wrong, and, and you're involved in it, and that. You know, that we go back there, we want to change the world. We don't want to see any more wars. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. want to see any more wars. Right. I don't want to see anybody going to kill. And, for, and we're always asking the same question, for what? For what? For what? Yeah. 
And, and uh, that's the big question. And people should come and hear Saul's <laughs> talk uh, tomorrow at the uh, Red and Black Cafe on uh, 12th Northeast 10th. It's 12 is the address, uh, Northeast 10th Street here in Portland, Oregon, just off Burnside. Uh, come on there about 6.30. Uh, we're asking just for donations. There'll be some light refreshments, 5 to $20 donation. Buy his book. Talk to Saul. Personally. Yeah, and I've got a few left. I've You've got, got a about few left. Ten left. So you know, come, <laughs> come, come early and buy often, as we say. But, <laughs> but uh, you can, buy all ten. <laughs> you can also go on Amazon.com and buy it. But uh, oh, great! Yeah, you know, I feel like I've, I've got some good reviews. I'm very proud of it. I've, I've, yeah, it's interesting that it takes you a long time to be proud of yourself. Yeah, it does. It, and then trust yourself again. And, it, and I found it very hard to say I'm very proud of this, but now I understand. I I did what I wanted to do. So. That's good. And, and as vets, we had to go through it, rebuild ourselves. Well, I wish we had more time, uh, so, but we have another guest on, and what I want to do is I want to thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you in Vietnam. It's a pleasure to hear you last night and to have you on my program today. And I want, uh, if people want to know more, of course, pick up the book. You can always contact Veterans for Peace. So mm -hmm. as also the... Uh, uh, are you president of the Vietnam I'm, Veterans? I'm president of the our, our first international chapter, which is in Vietnam, and uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that too. And we'll we hope to have a delegation of uh, Vietnam veterans yeah. uh, going to yeah. Vietnam as as a chapter and meeting people yeah. there in the chapter. And well, maybe one day great. we'll all be together in one chapter: Vietnamese, Americans, everybody. That is great. So, <laughs> uh, I think we're going to roll out of here okay. for a little bit and make a little. Uh, uh, mic change and stuff again. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my been a pleasure, real pleasure to have you. If they said this on the news, if they would clarify the picture Instead of seeking to confuse you, you could see the ice caps melting If you could watch the oceans rise, you could see the consequences right before your eyes If you knew the kids were dying, if you could look inside The river where their food comes from, filled with cyanide If you could hear the parents pleading, if they were looking right at you If you could see the anguish in their hearts, what if you knew? Bombs are falling if they showed them hit the ground If you could see the bodies flying If you could hear the sound If you could see the rubble where the hospital once stood If you saw the child's lifeless limbs Would you hold them if you could? If you knew that they were lying Every time they spoke for every laser-guided pinprick There were lives lost in the smoke If instead of just the generals They had doctors too to describe the carnage of the cluster bombs What if you knew? saying when they think you cannot hear if you understood what they do if for you it was so clear if you knew they shut down the factory in an economic ruse if you could kiss the cheek of the child in the sweatshop that made your shoes every time we went to war to fight our evil foes they told you we were really fighting for the good of ceos if you could feel the hunger of the many see the riches of the few if they told it like it is what if you knew Conspiracy, would you leave your suburbs, get out of your SUV? Would you hit the streets and fight for all our lives? Would you hold your ground when the stormtroopers arrive? If you knew that the whole planet depended on what you do now, would you take them in with the speed our times allow? If the pundits told the truth for just a week or two and real life was shown on TV, what if you knew? Okay, we're back again. Uh, uh, my second guest here is uh, Steve Gay, uh, Air Force veteran, artist, and served in the military uh, in May 1972. Isn't that correct? Correct. Absolutely. And I wanted, I wanted to make another announcement before we get going here. There's another event that's going to be happening. There's going to be uh, Portland Central American Solidarity Committee is going to be doing a film screening 
of a, a film called Sleep Dealer. And uh, this is uh, uh, at the Kenton Firehouse um, Theater. It's on 8105 North Brandon Street. This is going to be Friday, June 4th. And basically, this is going to be a, a, a sort of a benefit um, uh, raising money for we're sending a, a young delegation down to Honduras after the uh, recent coup that took place, the elections, which is uh, most international uh, uh, countries of the world are not recognizing as a legitimate election, uh, except the U.S. and a few of its allies. Um, and uh, so there are people that are still resisting. And so there's a young delegation here from Portland that is going down there to visit. There's actually, we just found out there may be a uh, soldier who served in one of the bases there in the 1980s, who's uh, a friend of one of our delegates who's thinking about going back because he knows what happened in that country and uh, he also was opposed to uh, this basically this uh, uh, coup that took place there. So it's an opportunity for you to go but it, this movie is an excellent movie. It's about a um, uh, uh, it's sort of this sort of robotic war that happens wow. and Mexico is a key element in that and uh, about a soldier who usually like operating drones and we're seeing that now in the war. So it's a good one to see. It's a science fiction film, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be an opportunity to hear from these young people. And uh, I love them all. They've really done a, a lot of great work here in the, in the years that I've been working with them. Uh, but Steve, we were, when I was just talking with Sol, we are talking about people that are coming back. We were talking about our own personal experiences of, of coming back from war. But there are a lot of issues when people come back. And there are a lot of issues that people have various health concerns and then we have to go not only deal with our problems but to go through the VA system. Uh, we're yeah. seeking help, we're seeking medical care, we're seeking all of these things and and I know talking with you in the past you told me uh, you, had, you were in the profession as a nurse yourself. Correct. So you know what it's like. Uh, yes, I do. So tell me how long were you a nurse and, uh, and I spent almost 15 years, Dan, as a nurse. Um, and while I, I typically started in hospital work, as many nurses do, ultimately gravitated towards long-term care. So I saw, um, you know, the where people come in and they get fixed right away and go home and continue normal lives, where the triumphs are are small, but then, um, or I should say significant for them, but still they go back to a normal life, whereas in long-term care, triumphs are much smaller, mm -hmm. and yet they mean just as much. So kind of so the whole broad spectrum of nursing. So you know, you know, how people are supposed to be treated, you know? I do. I know <laughs> and, customer service well, yes. And so all of a sudden, here you are on the opposite side of the uh, equation, basically, yes. and you're going up to the VA. Well, let's tell us, tell us why you're going up to the VA. Well. I'm getting old, like yeah. many people do, you yeah. know, and, and things like arthritis and stuff and set in and so forth. And I'd have to say initially, Dan, I'm fortunate. Um, I'm really, when you, when I go to the VA and, and you see some of the people there that have significant, uh, not only psychological issues, but of course physical, physical issues, they're missing limbs and so forth. I'm fortunate. Uh, I really you know, I'm still, for the most part, still moving, still getting up every morning and so forth. Uh, but as you deal with the VA and you see how people are treated and you don't feel the customer service and you start to feel the lack of humanity, um, you start to ask questions. And of course, that's why I'm in large degree here on this show today. And I thank you for having me. I'm, I'm you're, glad you're to, welcome, to be Mark. here. Well, I, I've, I've talked to many veterans and I hear all kinds of stories, you know. Um, for myself, uh, uh, I just avoided going to the to the veterans because uh, when I first came back, you yes. know, I had an exam that. in which the doors were open, uh, windows were open, people walking by, and Absolutely. just my per and my own personal modesty was at that time. I probably care less now, but right. at that time was you know I just felt like they're treating me like a piece of meat and. Uh, I'm not going back to those bastards, you know? <laughs> Just had that exact experience a month ago. Oh, is that right? In a yard, door wide open, uh -huh. laid there for eight hours, half naked, people going by and, you know, just looking in and I'm looking out. 
Yeah, it's, it, that's dehumanizing. It is. And, and there's no reason for it, you know. I mean, that, these are the things, these are professional. They've got a wonderful hospital up there, and many yeah. wonderful people that are doing things for people. But then you start running into some, not all people are meant to be there and should be serving our veterans. Correct. Uh, we have some people who, um, for me, I, I talk, just the, not just the hospital, but the administration itself. Correct. The administrative process is, uh, it's so difficult. And I was, when we were talking uh, earlier, you had said something to me that just kind of put it all together. And that was, uh, you know, when we started thinking, how many agencies are there yes. to help veterans work through all of this paperwork, all of these claims, all of these various organizations within Absolutely. there? Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I, I just signed up for veterans again because uh, my, my post-traumatic stress went up the yin-yang with these wars, and I finally recognized and stopped denying it, and right. uh, my Agent Orange problems, uh, uh, diabetes too, you know, and and when you began thinking about these things, I started going, I couldn't fill that paperwork out. I just, right. I couldn't, and it may not even just be that the, 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 the idea that it's, uh, that they weren't trying to help me, it's just as a, as somebody who had to deal with the military all my life, you know, in my early years, I can't put my hand to sign anything with them, you know. It was just so darn hard to do that. It's very and difficult. I, and then they were asking questions that I was saying, well, you've got the records. Why, why am I have to now go find all these records that I haven't looked at in 20, 30 years, right. and, and I've got to find this. So then I find out, thank God, through some other veterans who had to tell me, okay, now you can get a VSO officer, somebody at, either through Correct. VFW and or through the Clackamas uh, County or something Yeah, I went like through Multnomah County. Yeah. And they helped me fill out that work and told me what needed to be filled out. And then all I had to do was sign it. And I could sign it with them. But I was, it was that process. And then you think about, well, how many organizations, there's other organizations out there trying to help people through the education system the, and to explain this stuff. And there's lawyers and there's people. Yep. Why? <laughs> Why? Because it's an incredibly out of control bureaucracy. Um, and, and you and I have talked uh, about moldy aspects of my experience and, and why I would love to say to you my experience has been largely positive. Mm -hmm. And I, I will freely admit and I would want everybody to know that there absolutely are good people on the front lines. That's right. But these and, and they do their best within an incredibly, hugely bloated, out of control, non-transparent system where you have uh, thousands probably of for-profit, you know, non-profit, state, federal uh, organizations to try to help sort out one organization that's supposed to be helping the veterans. Right. And they do get some stuff done, absolutely. It's a huge number. But for me, what has turned me into a person who's willing to sit here on public TV and discuss this issue is the response to management. When you take service issues to them and you just want to sit down and talk with them mm -hmm. about these issues. And you can't do that because the systems that they set up to allow that are so tightly controlled, it becomes literally a full-time job to try to manage your health care. I go through the same feeling you do, mm -hmm. that you don't, you may be hurting, you may be struggling with something, and you don't want to call them. Right. Because you know it's just going to be a hassle. My most recent visit, was to ER, where I basically laid on a bed with an open door and a busy corridor, people streaming by, no offer of food, no offer of water, for eight hours. That's the second time I've had that experience in the, in the Portland VA ER. And other than missing my turn to go in and having to wait another two hours to even get in because they whispered my name and I was laying on my side, which I had to at that point because I was in pain, and they didn't come looking for me. So I had an extra two hours to wait just because they didn't bother to look for me. 
it's those sort of things that are daily occurrence. But what really at that point sets it off is when you go to management. And for me, a year ago almost now, the response to my continual saying to them, this is not good service, was to slap a health care agreement in front of me and say, sign it or lose your benefits. And what, what's this mean, this health care well, agreement? It, it's interesting because I, oh, I don't know, two or three months ago, I finally, after many struggles, got oh, a half an inch packet of the, the whole explanation of what's called coordinated care, which is actually part of the Disruptive Behavior Management Committee. And they, so they put a flag in the system that marks you as special. And as I, it's funny that you use the piece of meat analogy, they didn't really like it when I used that. <laughs> um, and when I became a, a patient in the coordinated care program, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't like the analogy of I'm another piece of meat and now especially marked red box. Most people don't even know the patient advocacy department in Washington, D.C. had no clue what coordinated care was about. Uh, many people along the lines don't. Uh, Rick Rutherford, Clackamas County VSO, and my VSO had no clue either. Mm -hmm. And so when he looked into it, um, you know, he got more information and, and he helped me get some information. But it's basically a part of the Disruptive Behavior Management Committee that simply uh, they meet, they discuss your case. And you're not part of this. You're never part of any part of the, the, the process except when they lay that agreement and say, you sign it or you lose your benefits. Boom, you're done. You can come to ER, but for the, you know, your normal stuff, your normal meds, your normal things, conditions, treatment for the conditions that don't warrant emergency treatment, you lose coverage. You're done. And they do that. And if you sign it? I went to, I didn't sign it at first. I resisted. I said, you know, you can't take my benefits away. Mm -hmm. I served my country. Right. I earned those benefits. But that didn't make any difference. So I actually went to Senator Wyden, mm -hmm. who the caseworkers who are paid by the VA in the office, and the first thing they tell you is, we don't work for Senator Wyden, or, or for the VA, we work for Senator Wyden. Right. And you're like, okay, doesn't make sense, but here's my story. They made a phone call. There was some sort of dialogue. I don't know where the lies actually fall. But the story I got from Wyden's office didn't match what happened. I went to the meeting, and it was the same old agreement. And despite me writing in big letters signed under duress across it, and the numbering not even being correct, not properly prepared document, it still stands today. And I can't get out of that. I can't get anybody to focus on it. There appears to be no appeal process for it. It's, uh, I still don't have all the answers. What, I do not what, know. What do they make you do in that kind? Well, it's, you have to treat everybody with respect. Right. And theoretically, they have to do the same for you. But the problem, really, and this is where um, it gets confusing, really, Dan, is that there's no, if they don't uphold their part of the agreement, and the, multiple times they have violated it since I signed that agreement, you can't do anything with that. In other words, you, you can't uh, complain. It, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a contract to say, uh, whatever we do to you, you take it, shut up, or else you don't get any more benefits. Is that they it? are the 800 pound gorilla yeah. with the aluminum baseball bat. And it's very clear even when you catch them in something, which I have done multiple times, and I deal, I'd say the only small benefit out of this, and I certainly wouldn't have wanted that, is Deborah Gasseter, who is the head, the registered nurse's head of coordinated care. I have her direct number. Mm -hmm. So there have been multiple times we've had conversations about issues, and she's flat out agreed with me that it's wrong at times. Mm -hmm. But does it change? No. Can you email your doctor? No. Do you wait forever for appointments? Absolutely. I mean, there's uh, all sorts of service issues. And there's rude people at times. Um, there's lots of system issues. But 
when you take all this stuff to management, mm -hmm. you can't get to them. Those pictures of the director and the associate director, and now they're, by the way, on the second temporary director in the past year of the Portland VA Medical Center and the second chief of staff, because nobody wants to stay there. You don't really get ever any answers. And if somebody walks on your toes and mm -hmm. is blatantly out there, mm -hmm. they'll protect that person. You'll never, you know, they just, they'll give you a canned, I'm sorry, and that's it. Well, you know that uh, uh, veterans are, well, they're a little crazy. I mean, they have post-traumatic <laughs> stress, you know, uh, they, oh, yeah, you know, all just you're all on the uh, edge, Dan. Absolutely. All on the edge. Always uh, on the edge, yeah. Pushing these people's yeah. buttons, right? And, yeah. Uh, but I thought that's what they're supposed to be there for. I mean, even if that, even, you know, people, I, I have a friend who, who gets angry very quickly uh, with his post-traumatic stress. Right. But he gets angry because of this bureaucracy, you know. Uh, he gets into Correct. that and he will blow up and he will get mad and he'll start right. yelling. Um, I had another guy who was going in for uh, evaluation of post-traumatic stress and uh, they asked him a few questions that just set him off. He just got up and walked out. He, he, right. he hasn't been back. Uh, when I went in for my post-traumatic stress, they started asking me questions about, you know, how did I feel about the war? Because I was wearing a uh, Veterans for Peace hat, you right. know. And I'm saying, well, what's this got to do with any of that? I mean, this politics now, you're talking right. politics, Absolutely. and I'm talking about what happened to me. And then they're Absolutely. saying, you know, you have, you have this little thing on this record. When I first came into, into uh, Vietnam, it was in August, last week in August, and these Mortars came in the very first day I hit, hit right. on Vietnam. And, but the, that was one event, and there was events after that, and events after that, and events after that, that happened in, in firefights and, and right. uh, uh, snipers, and then, of course people getting killed on mi in mines. And none of those things counted. They only wanted this one thing, they said, well, right. this is what happened. Right. And, and I said, wait a minute, you guys, have my war. This is the only thing that they accept that that's gonna. Right. And I'm going. I know. You know how do I, how do I prove you're the ones with the records, you're the ones that know what operation I was on. Yep. And uh, and I get and then I was I was upset and because he asked me how I felt about uh, going back to um, these young people going into Afghanistan. You know he he, he wasn't so much about Iraq but. He says, right. Afghanistan right. hit us. What do you feel about these guys and these terrorists are hitting? I says, I don't, I don't give a damn about these terrorists. I, I, we got criminals all over this country that are killing people and shooting people. Uh, you treat people as criminals. I don't need to see our guys going to die for right. a bunch of few criminals that have done a horrible crime. But I'm not afraid of people, and I'm, you know, on these issues, I'm afraid of what my government's doing to me. And Absolutely. But absolutely that I couldn't talk to him anymore, you right. know, and in 20 minutes, 20 minutes, right. they make an evaluation, which I've been working with a therapist for months, right. you know, and, and it's total opposite of what she's saying. So what the heck, uh, you know, how are people making decisions about people's lives if they're going to interview people in 20 right. minutes, push their buttons and yep. then say they're the ones with the problem because they blow up, you know. Right. Well, it's a very good point. Absolutely, Dan. I mean, the issue of it is, is that my yearly, right, yearly exams, which, you know, you, you have to go in with this laundry list because you will have 15 minutes with your doctor. My own doctor called me when I had called her, basically, and I got a return call like two and a half weeks later. And from her particular perspective, she took two and a half weeks to call me because it wasn't urgent and she was working 12-hour days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the management, the only real answer you get from them is to point their finger and say it's Congress's fault. But the reality of it is, is when you have local issues, when you have either no response, no callbacks, no answers, you always have to ask the same question over and over and over. That's a local issue. Right. I mean, there's no doubt that Congress makes some appropriations that are inappropriate or that, you know, too much money in one area and so forth. And that certainly affects the whole system as a whole. 
But locally here in Portland, we have a management of the Portland VA Medical Center that I think, personally, have, has pretty much wiped the human touch, except for the few people on the front line that are still trying, have pretty much wiped it out. Certainly, from management on up, there's no humanity. Any organization that is in charge of my health care, in charge of my health care, they're not my wardens, which not having ever been in prison, but they're not a warden, and yet they're in charge of my health care and they make me feel worse. They become the biggest stressor in my life. Something's wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. And that's all from management and me trying to change the way they treat people and trying to change the coordinated care. How many coordinated care patients are there out there that have been forced into signing an agreement because they had no choice? Well, that's interesting. Now, do you, um, you, isn't there a patient's advocacy huh. group? Tell me about... Sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just skip that subject, because who do they work for? Well, shouldn't they be independent? Uh, you'd think so. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. But they work for the VA, and by their own admission, they're nothing more than a pass-through office. You're the patient advocate. I call you. You call the department. Say, Steve's angry. Okay, so if you're the department person, you maybe call Steve, maybe you don't. But that's what they basically do. Um, I, I've never felt from dealing one, and, and they know me personally. In fact, they don't even call me back anymore. Uh, I don't really feel they've truly very much advocated for me. And we have all these different satellite uh, groups to go to. I mean, we can go up on the hill. You have your primary care doctor maybe in this place. Yeah, sometimes mine just actually you, moved. That's correct, yeah. And sometimes you go over to Vancouver. Sometimes right. I go out to Hillsboro. Right. Um, I like the Hillsboro place. Mm -hmm. a really nice little place. Uh, there are some of them are very state-of-the-art. Yeah. State-of-the-art, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, and then the, up on the hill, you know, uh, we have uh, OSHU up there. Mm -hmm. and we've got... That's where they get most of their doctors from. Yeah. So you have, training, these, yeah. you have these wonderful sort of a university for doctors and, yeah. and the VA together, which should provide the best care in the nation. You'd you know? think so. You would think so, you know. I waited, and actually yeah. there was an article done on the Oregonian uh, on me several years ago where I'd waited for six months for a hernia operation. And had they not farmed me out to the, they had a program going to farm you out because they were overwhelmed mm -hmm. with people that needed hernias. So basically, they put me out Farmed me out, it was done two weeks later. I'm done, finished. Right. So there are potential fixes. Yeah, but and, you know, they I just want, need to be responsible. We wanna, we're gonna actually carry this program on a little more. Wonderful. Because uh, we can only get through so much on this and we wanna <laughs> talk, lot, about, yeah. talk about other things that are available. But uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the other things that I was thinking is uh, as, we have these primary doctors. I know that for me, um, you know, I can't go directly to my primary doctor. I have to call through the VA system who has to set up an Correct. appointment and then they call me back and tell me. And, and I can't directly pay there either. They have to say, send me a, a bill and then yeah. I, am I supposed to pay this bill or I'm not supposed to pay this? Is it covered under my right. uh, disability or is it not covered? And then I find out it's been adding up because uh, it's not clear to me what I was supposed to do and now I gotta go and pay a couple hundred bucks uh, for something. You know, I mean, just a bunch of confusion, which could be, I would, a lot if, of if I know about it, I would yep. pay it right then and there, yep. da, 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 you know. Incredible uh, amount of convolution. But I can't understand why I can't call my doctor. I mean, I regular healthcare system, I call my doctor, make an appointment, go in, do it. Why is that? That's an separate? easy question to answer, Dan because the 800 pound gorilla says it'll be this way <laughs> and that's it but it doesn't you know, make you don't have a choice to me you know i mean i uh, just don't it doesn't understand have to why. make sense unfortunately <laughs> i wish i wish i had an easy answer for that one but it doesn't have to make sense that's what it seems to be so well i began to wonder why it's not making sense though and and um, for a lot of like we say there's a lot of money that's going um, <clears throat> 
for all these illnesses that are coming in. We have like 300,000 right. uh, Iraqi veterans with post-traumatic stress claims, yep. and that's 2,000 uh, in, in about two years ago. Those were the figures, and another 350,000 uh, post-traumatic brain injuries, all the people with various wounds, arms, legs. Right. Um, some horrible missing, stuff. Uh, some very horrible stuff that are going on, and, and the rise in uh, Vietnam veterans and their post-traumatic stress, uh, also yep. suicides. I mean, there is a huge number of problems that are existing. And we have women in the military now, so that you have, I mean, we always did, but we have them in the battle right. zones, and they're coming yeah. back with the same problems. Uh, so we start making these things bigger. Yep. Um, so we need to find out how money is being appropriated. Uh, it seems to me they're creating this bureaucracy so that they just don't have enough money, and they would, people get disappointed, and and be pushed off the uh, rolls, or like me some 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, walked out and didn't yep. go back for many years, you know? Yep. Maybe I would have never gone back. And they wouldn't have paid the benefits that they owed me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna carry this program over. Great. Um, um, and we'll do it wonderful. in the next, uh, <clears throat> on our next program, uh, another half hour of, of a program. Uh, this is uh, uh, Metro East Community uh, uh, TV on Channel 11. It's also being streamed with, uh, on Ustream uh, TV. Uh, you can go on the internet and follow our program there. We are on the fourth Saturday of every month, and I want to thank you for watching and coming in. Uh, I think this is a great program for people to find out uh, stories like Sewell's, stories like yours. And we want uh, to, to also recognize that uh, uh, Kelly Labonte and Jim Lockhart have Absolutely. spent a lot of time in uh, producing this program and making it available for people in the community. Thanks again, and I hope everybody uh, keeps checking in. Yep. And check into uh, Veterans for Peace. Yes, absolutely. Uh, IVAW, uh, Iraqi Veterans Against the War. There are a lot of people working on these issues, and we need more people working on them, yep. and we need more people asking more questions. More voices, the better, Dan. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Well, it's